everyone. This is our great pleasure to organize a KFNL's first public program. I am Atanu Sarkar, Associate Professor at the Division of Community Health and Humanities. I teach environmental health uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, Memorial University, and also chair of KFNL committee. And uh, KFNL was formed in March 2021, almost a year, a little less than a year, actually. And we have now almost 28 members. That is great. And we are getting more and more requests. And we're expecting that uh, eventually we'll have a really sizable number of members and we can actually do a lot of uh, community-based programs and needs to fulfill the need of this province and also Atlantic Canada. Now, CAPE, I, 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 I'm sure a lot, of, uh, lot of, uh, lot of people know what CAPE is, but those who are not familiar with the CAPE, just to let you know that very briefly, it is the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. It is a national organization. Name implies it is for the physicians, but we have a lot of non-physicians and uh, interested individuals who are actively engaged in these organizations. Every province having their own region and uh, uh, engaged in local activities. And CAPE has a very good success stories in changing laws and uh, and this public interest group is working with uh, different environmental uh, uh, issues. Uh, so today we are, we are pleased to introduce our speaker. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, park, uh, it is called Park Prescription. The title of the program, uh, the workshop is Park Prescription, Prescribing Nature for Personal and Planetary Health. Uh, we will welcome Dr. Melissa Lem. She is a president elect of CAPE and director of Park Prescription for the British Columbia Park Foundation. We have two uh, medical learners, uh, Brooklyn Rolick, second year medical student, CAPE Saskatchewan, and also Sejal Bhargava, fourth year medical student and co chair of CAPE Saskatchewan. So let's in, uh, welcome uh, uh, Dr. Lame, Brooklyn, and Sejal. And I, now I will hand over to Dr. Lame for the presentation. Great, thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's, it's my absolute pleasure to be joining you from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations here in Vancouver, British Columbia, I think five and a half hours or something behind you. It's, it's just great that we connect in, in this way. Um, so today, as Atunu mentioned, I'll be talking, I don't know if you mentioned that, but this is on the flyer. We'll be talking about Canada's National Nature Prescription Program, PARX, which is powered by the BC Parks Foundation, and how prescribing nature can not only be good, be good for our own health and our personal health, but also for planetary health. So I think we all know that when we head out into nature, when we spend time in nature, it we feel we feel great. You know, we feel more refreshed. We feel. Um, calmer, we feel more focused. But there's actually this huge body of evidence to back that up, which I only discovered just over a decade ago. And since then, I've made it my mission to share this with, with my colleagues and with my community. And, and we're having some success with that recently, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So just getting into the presentation, I just want people to um, kind of, well, I guess the chat's disabled, but think to yourself in one word, describe how you feel when you're outside in nature. So I mentioned some words already, just think to yourself about what that word might be. And so when we do this exercise with, with other people, um, we often will assemble all those words into a word cloud when they, when they enter them in. And I don't know if looking at this uh, word cloud, you can see some of the words that you've, you've thought of. So there's calm, peaceful, grounded, happy, wonderful, re-energized. And again, there's this, this intuitive sense we have is, is really backed up by the evidence. So these are just two different infographics that I've been given permission to share. Um, the one on the left is from the Canadian Association of Mental Health, and the one on the right is from a group in, in the U.S. And essentially from, there, there are a huge number of different health conditions. Uh, there's almost no health condition that nature isn't good for. So from um, bone density to diabetes and high blood pressure to stress and, and uh, anxiety and depression to ADHD in children, um, work satisfaction, pain recovery after, after operations, um, there's a huge body of evidence showing how nature, how good nature is for our bodies and our brains. And so when you think about why, you know, the, so this, this is an initiative that's hosted by the BC Parks Foundation and you wonder um, like, why, why is it, why, why would it be 
uh, why would a conservation organization or one that's really focused on natural spaces be interested in, in health? And why would I be interested in working with them as a healthcare provider? And really the reason is because not a lot of our, I mean, a minority of our health status actually comes from what we do as healthcare practitioner, practitioners within it. So as you can see, around 20 to 25% of our healthcare status comes from our healthcare system. And there's so many factors outside of that from our environment to our biology and different life factors that are really responsible for the majority of our health. And as you can imagine, as you can see from some of those, um, those words listed in that column on the right hand side, having more nature in our environments and having nature be part of these different factors can really in improve those factors and improve health outcomes in general. So I don't know if this sound is gonna work, but essentially this is a busy city street in, uh, in Toronto. And I, I want to talk a bit about why um, nature is good for our bodies or is good for our brains. So there are two major theories as to why nature, I think the sound isn't working because I can't hear it. But anyway, there are two major theories as to why nature is really good for our brains. And the first one is attention restoration theory. And what it says is that these busy city or city environments like this with lots of flashing lights and traffic and crowds and hard edges really require us to constantly focus our attention to navigate around these different obstacles. And so what that does is it depletes our powers of conscious attention and it, it increases fatigue and irritability, which is obviously bad for our brains. Whereas when you spend time in nature, it's a source of soft fascination. So it's interesting, but it doesn't require us to constantly use those powers of, of attention. And so what that does is it, it refreshes our brains and restores our brains and reduces that fatigue and irritability. The second theory as to why nature is so good for our brains is called stress reduction theory. So when you experience a stressful event, the theory goes that if you spend time in a natural surrounding during that event and after that event, your brain is actually more resilient so you can rebound from that stress faster. And that really comes down to evolution is what these researchers think. So if you think about it, when early humans spent time in, in biodiverse environments with lots of trees, lots of plants, lots of animals, um, it really had everything they needed. Those environments really had everything they needed to survive. So from sources of food and water to um, trees that they could use to build shelter or heights they could climb up to look out for predators or where their community would next move to. And so over time, Brains in these early humans who, who spent time in these biodiverse environments became less stressed because they survived longer. It conferred a survival advantage to want to spend time in these environments. So essentially, these early humans have passed down those nature-loving genes to future generations. And that's really why it's hardwired into our brains to, to prefer to spend time in nature. There's also this body of evidence around phytoncides, which are um, volatile organic compounds that plants and trees release into the air in kind of nature-rich environments. And there's research showing that when you just breathe in phytoncides, it doesn't actually even have to be in nature, but it, bo it can boost your immune function. So um, it can boost your levels and activity of immunoproteins and also your levels of natural killer cells, which fight off uh, viruses and bacteria. So from what's going on with our brains um, to what we're seeing, to what we're smelling, nature is really good for, for us from, from head to toe. So I want to get into some of my favorite studies about um, the connection between nature and health. And so this is a study that was done in Toronto. And what they did was they combined high, resolu high resolution satellite imagery, individual tree data, and Ontario health study data and self reports of health perception. And what they found was that 10 more trees per block after they controlled for a variety of different confounders like income, um, like health status, proximity to roads, that kind of thing. They found that 10 more trees per block affected their health perception, similar to an increase in personal income of $10,000 per year, uh, moving to a neighborhood with $10,000 per year higher median income or being seven years younger. And so there are probably a fair number of health professionals in this audience. We know that income and age are both major kind of factors in, in how good our health status is. So I thought it was really neat how this study brought down tree canopy and tree number um, to, to different things that we know do improve our, our health. So that's a, that's a neat one. I'd encourage you to look it up. I like this study because it really speaks to nature as medication, which is interesting. So this was a small pilot study that was done in Chicago, and they took 17 kids with ADHD on three different 20 minute walks through a city park, through a downtown area and through a residential area. And what they found was that that 20 minute walk in the park 
improves their DSB performance similar to levels in kids without ADHD. So just um, briefly, DSB is digit span backwards. What you do is you recite a, a kind, of, kind of a sequence of numbers in a row to the study subject, and then they repeat those numbers backwards back to you. And the more numbers you can repeat, the better your attention and memory. And so you can see in this in this chart on the right hand side here um, that park walk actually improved their DSB score significantly more than just the neighborhood walk or, or the downtown walk. And in fact, this rivaled the peak effects of pres prescription stimulant medication or Ritalin. So it's neat how this compares nature to, to prescription medication. I mean, no, but I want to point out that no one is saying that um, Nature is going to replace all the different things that stimulant medication does, um, but I think it speaks to how powerful nature time can be as an adjunct for, for this and other kind of cognitive and mental health conditions. So there's just a poll, Natalie, if you can help me launch, um, and this comes down to, to recommendations. So I'm a physician, you know, when I, when I prescribe something, I want to know how much to prescribe and how often. So this speaks to dose. So um, I just want you to answer this poll. People report significantly better health and well-being after spending how much time in nature per week? So is it one hour or two hours, three, four or five? I'll just invite you to, uh, to select the one you think is correct. And Natalie, maybe when the majority of people or enough people have answered, you can just publish the, the poll result there. Okay, looks like most people thought two hours and then kind of an equal distribution around one and three hours. So, so good answers, people. Um, the actual answer is two hours. So it was really, really handy that shortly before we launched in November 2020, starting in BC, this study came out about nature dosing. And so this was a study of about 20,000 adults in England. And um, they asked them how much recreational time they spent in nature each week. And again, controlled for a variety of different factors. And what they found was that their likelihood of reporting good health or high well-being was significantly greater when their nature contact reached at least 120 minutes or two hours each week. And those benefits continued to accrue over time and they kind of peaked over, you know, between the 200 to 300 minute per week mark. But that two hour mark is kind of where, where those well-being benefits flipped over. So that's why in our program, we have a standard recommendation that patients spend at least two hours in nature each week to, to, um, to improve their health. And I think it's really, uh, useful and actually convenient from a clinical perspective that exercise recommendations from Health Canada also closely follow this. So as many of us know, Health Canada recommends that we get at least two and a half hours of physical activity, um, moderate to vigorous physical activity each week. And I think the fact that this two hours matches it quite closely feels like something that's doable and also something that you can incorporate into physical activity, although you don't necessarily have to, to get those benefits. So here's poll question number two about how much nature do you need each time within that two hours? So the most efficient drop in cortisol levels happens between what time in nature? So I'll get you Natalie to launch that poll again. Great. Okay, so it looks like we have a pretty equal division between 10 to 20 minutes and 20 to 30 minutes. And um, you know what's really interesting is that you can actually get some mental health benefits from spending just five minutes sitting on a bench in nature. But in terms of um, what our recommendation is, the most efficient drop happens between that 20 and 30 minute mark. So this was another study that came out in 2019. Um, they asked over eight weeks, 36 urban dwellers to have a nature experience in an outdoor place that brought them a sense of contact with nature. And I think the really important piece here is that it was self-defined. They didn't actually tell them you have to be in this area that has a certain amount of biodiversity. It has to be a park, can't be a garden, has to be a provincial park or national park. They self-defined it. Um, and so they asked them to spend time there at least three times per week and for 10 minutes or more. And what they found was that their cortisol or stress levels dropped 
over 20% more after a nature experience. So you can see between the 20 and 30 minute mark here is where that, that rate of cortisol drop is the fastest. So that's why we have, again, a standard recommendation in our program that you spend at least 20 minutes in nature each time to get the biggest bang for your buck when it comes to that stress reduction. And, and again, I want to come back to that point about nature being what you make of it. There is research showing that you can get those health benefits when you feel like you've had a meaningful nature experience over and above this study only. So in some ways, I think it's important for us, especially in the city, to redefine what we what we see as nature. And then if we can slow down and connect and feel like we've had a nature, a natural experience outside, we can we can see some of those health benefits even in the city. All right, so, um, and so this kind of comes, I want to go back to that question I, uh, or the, the, talk, the talking I had originally about why BC Parks Foundation really wanted to lean into this health messaging when they're really focused on parks. And it's because health is an incredibly effective message for, for encouraging support for policy changes. Um, not only are nurses and doctors and other health professionals consistently rated among the most trusted health professionals in the world, but the health message itself is effective. So this was a neat study that um, uh, that came out just last year. And, and basically they conducted surveys with over 7,500 participa participants in five countries um, across the world. And they read, they asked participants to read five pairs of statements and ask them which would make them more likely to support policies tackling climate change. And what they found was that when they framed uh, these kind of these policies in terms of different effects, health and environmental framing increased support. Economic framing actually had no effect on average people and opportunity framing kind of like, you know, if you spend time in nature, you'll, you'll feel better versus if you don't spend time in nature, you'll, you'll feel awful. That positive frame also increased their support uh, more than threats. And they also found that focusing on present impacts of climate change um, were more effective and more motivating than focusing on the future impacts like what will ha um, happen down the line. So really, again, the summary is that focusing on current health impacts and opportunities and public policy messaging are more mo motivating to change behavior and, and again, increase support for policy changes than really any of these other messages that we often hear from governments. We've heard for so many years, many decades beforehand, you know, and I care about polar bears. You know, I've, I've, I've worked in the subarctic and in the Arctic and I've encountered polar bears, um, but really that's not what moves most people. What moves most people is the health of themselves and their families. Um, so I think that's something we have to keep in mind when communicating. And also um, the reason why connecting to nature is so great is uh, because uh, just because it's good for the planet too. So healthcare is a major contributor to global carbon dioxide emissions. If global healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth highest emitter in the world. So um, connecting people to nature, as we've seen through these studies, is really good for our health and anything that improves our health is going to reduce the burden on the healthcare system and reduce carbon emissions. Also, urban nature makes cities healthier. If we have more um, nature in our environments, not only does it um, moderate heat and also help to filter rainwater and prevent flooding, but it's also good for us. Also, children who are more uh, who have more nature experiences are more likely to become adult environmentalists, and adults who are more connected to nature are more likely to protect it. So, it, what's really interesting is people who connect more to nature don't only want to protect nature itself; they also tend to engage in more pro-environmental behaviors, like recycling more, like saving electricity, like advocating and participating in climate action. So, I like to think that every time one of my colleagues or I writes a nature prescription we're also doing a, a small part for the planet. The UN Environment Program Executive Director has said that nature is one of the most effective ways of combating climate change and should be part of every country's climate strategy. So it's been estimated that if we fully embrace nature-based solutions for climate change, which focus on restoring and expanding nature while addressing different societal issues, this could get us over a third of the way towards our 2030 Paris Agreement targets. Right now, I'm not sure what the stat is, it's maybe anywhere between five to 10% of um, global investment is in nature-based solutions for climate change. And so there's a big gap of, of potential there. And I think by healthcare professionals, by getting, as healthcare professionals, by getting our strong trusted voice behind the importance of conservation and connecting people to nature and preserving these wild spaces for our health and for the health of the planet, we could, we could help close that gap, which I think is exciting as well. So um, I just want to give a quick example of what happened uh, on our West Coast as a result of people not having as much access to nature or, or trees um, this past summer. So this is a map of, of uh, the kind of the temperatures during the heat dome. 
which in June and July killed, you know, almost 600 um, people within BC within the space of a, a week to end the kind of the ripple effects over the next month. And this was thought to be 150 times more likely because of climate change. And if you look at this heat map, this area, the downtown east side is one of the most, the, is one basically one of the lowest uh, income areas in Vancouver. And 70% of hospitalizations from the heat dome came from this area of the city, you know, within Vancouver. And if you look, I mean, I live in this area here in Kitsilano, lots of trees by the beach, and even my family was suffering from the heat. But so basically, I mean, I, I think climate change affects us all. Global heating affects us all, but it especially affects people of lower income and who have less tree cover. And, you know, because trees shade, they, they, reduce, uh, they reduce air pollution, they have all kinds of different um, positive effects. So I think really increasing nature in our environments is a major equity issue as well. Just really quickly, um, we were very, very proud when, when PARX was, was recognized by the World Health Organization in their COP26 special report on climate change and health this past fall. And they were one of only two case studies cited from North America um, as examples of organizations that were taking healthy climate action. And so anyway, it, uh, it was really gratifying to have PARX uh, recognized on a global stage and, and, uh, and really awareness about our initiatives spread around the world. Um, so if you're interested in our program, head to parkprescriptions.ca. You click the button, get started, if you want to register to start prescribing if you're a licensed healthcare professional. We'll send you a customized nature prescription file like this one you can see on the left-hand side. And our website also has lots of quick tips and, and resources on how to prescribe nature effectively, including 14 different fact sheets broken down into adult and children um, and different health conditions as to how nature is good for uh, different, different conditions. And then we've got some amazing media coverage, um, including right now in this past week, we've, we've gone global with our message. This is Sejal and uh, Brooklyn, who really, really did a fantastic job with the Saskatchewan launch and got lots of media coverage there and are just fantastic um, advocates and messengers for messengers for the for the program. And this is our most recent um, kind of announcement, actually. So we. Last week, we just announced a new collaboration with Parks Canada, where um, healthcare providers registered in our program can actually prescribe free Parks Canada passes to their patients to reduce barriers to nature access. And we're asking them to prioritize patients who live near Parks Canada administered sites, and also those who, who really, you know, for whom the cost of a pass might be a barrier to access. So this is a really exciting announcement that's gotten a ton of, uh, of attention. And so thank you very much for, for listening, and I'm going to hand it over to to Seychelles in Brooklyn to, to talk about how they successfully launched PREC prescriptions in Saskatchewan. Okay, thanks Dr. Lem and thanks for having us, uh, Dr. Sarkar and the rest of Cape Newfoundland. Um, can you see my screen okay and hear me okay? Is it possible to make it one slide at a time? Oh yeah, for sure. Oh, such a rookie. Okay, perfect. How's that? Beautiful. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you for the incredible introductory presentation, Dr. Lem. Oh my goodness, I've already progressed through slides where we don't need to do that yet. Oh my goodness. It's automatically going, so I'm going to reshare it. All right, how's that now? I hope it doesn't progress through on its own anymore. Um, thank you everybody for the warm welcome and for attending this presentation. Brooklyn and I are very excited to take up the second half of this slot, uh, just to try and orient you and bring you guys a bit more of a perspective locally on how we were able to launch this incredible program uh, in our home province. Um, so we are both members of Cape Saskatchewan. I'm co-chair and we're both medical students at the University of Saskatchewan. 
So just starting off with a bit of a land recognition, because we are all in different places around uh, so-called Canada. Um, we're currently situated on Treaty 4 and 6 territories, homeland of the Métis. And I always like to recognize that learning occurred on this land prior to the arrival of any institution as learners. Okay, so as introduced by uh, Dr. Lem and Dr. Sarkar, uh, we are the Cape Saskatchewan Regional Chapter. We've now launched uh, for about a year. We started, our first meeting was in January of 2021. Uh, we've accumulated about 50 people on our mailing list and about 15 extremely engaged members that attend our monthly meetings. Um, and we are um, really proud of the work that we've done so far in Saskatchewan, including launching Prescription Nature being one of the major ones, and now taking on various um, advocacy projects to green health care uh, throughout Saskatchewan-based hospitals. So we wanted to kind of give you an idea of how we came to launch PARX in Saskatchewan. And first, I wanted to start out with a personal story because Sajil and I both are medical students and we had a, in another lifetime, a career in competitive running for both um, cross country and track and field teams during university. So here I wanted to share a few photos because I did graduate from Dalhousie and during those four years, I spent a lot of hours running outdoors. And actually I know someone here today I graduated with, so that's great to see. Um, so basically where I wanted to go with this is as a cross country runner, we get to spend a lot of time outdoors. We get to experience all of the diverse weather events that come through. And really there wasn't a long run on a Sunday where my team wouldn't stop and take a picture of nature. I don't know if that is a generational thing, but it just felt like you could kind of capture and just appreciate it more when you had it on camera. And really, when I look back at the time that I spent running, being outdoors in nature, which is so rejuvenating and was really a key component to my mental health and ability to get through undergrad. And now as a medical student, whenever I can get outside, whether I'm running or not, it is something that I try to keep in my routine. And even when I compare that to my track and field career, if any of you have been to the old Dalplex um, in uh, Dalhousie, the odd hexagonal indoor track, you would really be able to experience that pain. You don't really get that same health benefit when you're running indoors versus outdoors. So really as a medical student, as a runner and really a nature lover, this is something where we first handily experience those health benefits ourselves. And really we wanted to kind of share that more publicly and get individuals in Saskatchewan involved. Something that really stood out to us was how PARX, the website, it is both user-friendly for both patients and physicians. And it's an incredible centralized place to go to see all of the incredible evidence to support the health benefits of being out in nature. And from a medical student perspective, we learn about social prescribing. We learn about the importance of diet and exercise and health and, um, sorry, and sleep. However, we also believe that nature should be that fourth pillar, and it's something incredible to put in your toolbox as a physician just to help engage patients and to help them with their health in any way we can. Thanks, Brooklyn. So getting into a little bit about how we actually took the steps to launch Prescription Nature or um, Parks Prescriptions in Saskatchewan. Um, initially was with reaching out to Dr. Lem via Twitter, <laughs> um, and with some conversations and thorough emailing, uh, we were able to kind of identify some key steps to gain support through major, um, stakeholders in Saskatchewan. So our first move was to try and gain physician support, uh, and we accomplished this by proposing a motion at the Saskatchewan Medical Association, uh, Regional Assembly. So they had um, a spring regional assembly and we basically wrote a motion. One of our Cape Saskatchewan uh, family physician members was able to propose the motion as an attendee at the meeting. Um, and it passed with an overwhelming 85% majority, uh, which gave us endorsement from the Saskatchewan Medical Association. Following that, we gained a lot of traction in the medical community. We reached out to the SANP, um, the Saskatchewan Association of Nurse Practitioners, who were on board once they had heard that we'd gained the SMA support and were really excited 
uh, to become interdisciplinary partners, as we know that any licensed healthcare professional can be a major prescriber. So we're really excited to have the, the nurse practitioners on board. Um, we then reached out to the following the following organizations, which were honestly very, very supportive and really excited to see something like this be available to Saskatchewan healthcare professionals. Um, so the Saskatchewan College of Family Physicians, the Saskatchewan Public Health Association Board uh, agreed to support us. And then obviously, of course, of course, BC Parks Foundation and our uh, local membership of Cape Saskatchewan. So through this, we actually gained a lot of logos we could put on promotional material. And we gained a lot of supporters in terms of people who are willing to talk about this, that we could share resources with and send posters to that were then able to use, um, use those as communication tools in their day-to-day -day practice through these interdisciplinary settings. And really, as Dr. Lem alluded to, media coverage was a huge component of this push to gain just kind of more public awareness. So through the College of Medicine, we wrote a blog post. We had some interviews with CBC News and um, a radio interview with Shauna Powers. And really, between reaching out to media contacts through the Saskatchewan Medical Association and even at times cold emailing, um, this was really a key component to our launch in Saskatchewan. The other key component I'd say here is also social, social media. Um, Twitter and Instagram were extremely handily available and um, really great for garnering media attention as well. And we utilize that for sure. So uh, in terms of promotion across Saskatchewan, with the help of the endorsing organizations that I mentioned a couple slides previous, we engaged in media interviews, we wrote articles um, and we kind of made up our own versions of prescription nature posters that were a bit more specific to Saskatchewan landscapes, um, which was a bit of a messaging strategy we decided on at the Cape Saskatchewan meeting, um, was using local landscapes on our posters because um, we just don't have mountains. <laughs> so we needed some flat landscapes to go with us here. <laughs> so um, we were able to share these posters with physicians to post up in their offices in both waiting rooms uh, as a patient available resource. So one that had utilized a bit more of like a patient friendly language that made someone want to engage uh, their physician or a practitioner in a bit of a conversation about like what is prescription nature versus the one that we're showing you on this screen is the one that was designed more to target physicians as a bit more of like an infographic where we could tell them what exactly this program was, where exactly they could find more information and who exactly endorsed this program in Saskatchewan. Um, and then I'd say another really large part of getting the word out there across Saskatchewan was starting to do presentations. Uh, we were asked initially by members of the College of Medicine. We presented at Psychiatry Grand Rounds locally. Um, and then eventually that just like the more people listen to the story of prescription nature, the more people wanted to be able to bring it to their own networks, um, including a peer support group network. We're presenting it. We presented at Saskatchewan's Nature Week, um, a lot of like community based organizations as well. So I think the other aspect of prescription nature is presenting to healthcare professionals, but as well as presenting to the public, saying that, you know, educating that nature has all these benefits and that this is something that you can access and to kind of try and create a conversation and dialogue around prescribing time in nature. Another key component to that as well was from the medical student lens as um, Sajil was kind of getting at. We have also taken it upon ourselves to have different workshops and even like through Psychiatry Skills Night or specific PARX, um, presentations um, where we had lunch talks and things like that was another great way to kind of push from the uh, future practitioner point of view. And here we wanted to show you a few of our posters that we've been sending widely to different offices, making use of some of our Saskatchewan landscapes. We also don't have oceans, but we do have many lakes. So there are great places to go in Saskatchewan. And really the big push from these posters too was to kind of empower patients. You don't need to first hear this from your physician. Also letting patients know that why don't you bring this up with your physicians as well and kind of um, take your own health into your hands and have those conversations as well. So these are just a few of our posters. 
And then um, these are just a few quotes from some of the physicians in Saskatchewan, um, along with other healthcare practitioners as the launch came about. And something that really resonated with me was the amount of doctors out there saying that they were informally um, prescribing per se time out in nature without writing it down on paper. And they love that since this launch, there is a centralized location that they can send patients to in case they want to find out more information. And also kind of just supporting the evidence that by physically writing down a prescription that can go a lot further than just a simple conversation with a patient. Uh, perfect. So current uptake in Saskatchewan, and there's Brooklyn's dog Henry on the side of the slide there, um, exploring uh, Cranberry Flats, which is a little park we have near Saskatoon. Um, this number is as of, I think, either December or January, uh, so late 2021 or early 2022, that Saskatchewan had 70 registered prescribers. After the initial launch, uh, I think we had about 25 in the first month, and then by the second or third month, about 50. So it has been like steadily growing and with the more media coverage, the more presentations we're doing, we see an uptick in uh, prescribers. Um, and we're really excited by the most recent announcement in partnership with Parks Canada, because I know that that's garnered a lot of attention, especially here in Saskatchewan. So excited to see an updated take on this number. So in terms of future directions, now that we've established launching, we've done the initial uh, media push and like, here it is, here's the program, here's who can prescribe it, here's who can access it type information launch. Uh, we kind of brainstormed, you know, what, what would the next steps be in terms of getting this program to be more well known and prescribed more frequently and more often utilized. Um, more prescribers obviously would be really one of the bigger goals. So um, robust advertisements through the endorsing organizations that we mentioned previously. So um, giving them updated numbers and updated statistics in terms of how many prescribers, updated posters, um, testimonials as we receive them would be one way that we could reconnect with these endorsing groups and be like, keep spreading the word. This is still something that um, is beginning to have a bit of an uptake, but we'd love to see more of you participate. Increasing patient awareness, as Brooklyn touched on, is another one. Um, it's important to empower patients as well, take their health into their own hands by, by um, providing them with this information. Um, another direction that we've had connections through Cape Saskatchewan with is in collaboration with hospital foundations. Um, we have a member of Cape Saskatchewan who is really works quite closely with these memberships or with this foundation, sorry. Um, and has been bringing it up at their meetings to try and explore potential areas for growth um, in partnership with them. Um, and then collaborations with provincial parks and other outdoor spaces, as we saw earlier, and then um, engaging with medical students as well, which Brooklyn has been doing a fantastic job of spearheading. I don't know if you want to chat about um, what it's, a couple of the ways that you've done that. I know you mentioned some earlier. I'll just take one quick minute, but it's been really great just to see the excitement and enthusiasm from my classmates and colleagues. Um, we've now had a few different events in a few different ways, and really just as our momentum continues, there's starting to be this pressure and this push from medical students to actually have formal teaching about PARX and um, just the way we do about um, exercise prescriptions and other modalities of social prescribing. I think that the more events that we've put together, there is a push to go towards curriculum and also writing op-eds and just finding ways to kind of, again, like I mentioned, increase that toolbox so that when we become prescribers ourselves, that this just becomes second nature. And thanks, that's it for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, it is so exciting presentation by Dr. Lame and Brooklyn and Sejal. And it is so relevant in today's uh, time. Uh, I mean, society, where society is more and more getting, you know, uh, relying upon the pills as uh, the only solution of all these health issues. You are actually turning the tide and you are giving it such a more uh, a practical solution and with evidence, which is so uh, motivating for us. And uh, I'm so excited by Brooklyn and Sejal, despite your uh, 
a uh, lot of you know the time on study you are actually taking out some time and doing such a wonderful job and it is so it is great motivation for our cape nl i mean we can definitely think of similar kind of approach in our province as you know the newfoundland labrador is blessed with a lot of uh, so many nice trails and the parks and it is a beautiful province i think we have all the uh, ingredients to have uh, the park prescription for newfoundland labrador and also other atlantic provinces and we look forward to having such kind of initiative in near future so now i'm going to introduce dr stephanie atkinson she, uh, she is our committee member she is an orthopedic surgeon from corner brook which is you know western part of the island and dr atkinson will uh, coordinate the question and answer dr atkinson please hi everybody it's um, a pleasure to be here with all of you so 